Okay, so this talk is going to be an example of a function which has a Taylor series. It's infinitely differentiable, but there's a point uh, in the domain where the Taylor series exists and it doesn't converge to the function. In fact, uh, the function it converges to agrees with the original function only at that point about which you're taking the Taylor series. In this case, we the function is defined like this. So it's defined as zero at zero. And at any non-zero point, it's defined as e to the minus one over x square. X of something just means e to the power of that. Okay. Uh, just makes it less crammed to write like this. Otherwise, I would have to squeeze this expression in a superscript. Okay. And uh, you're doing this at the point x not equals zero. So you want to find the Taylor series at x not equals zero. So first, my claim is that actually it's infinitely differentiable at zero and all the derivatives, including the function value itself, so the f0 as well as f prime 0, f double prime 0, all of them are equal to 0. Okay, we'll come back to the proof of this later. But let's just assume this for now and see what we get. Well, what does that tell you? What's the Taylor series of f at 0? Well, how is the Taylor series defined? Taylor series of a function is defined as what? As the sum... Well, at 0. So, uh, yeah, k equals 0 to infinity. What? I've to the k zero. kth derivative mm -hmm. over k vectorial times x to the k. Zero. Yeah, in general, it would be x minus x not to the k, and this would be f k at x not. But here we're doing it at zero, so this is what we get. Okay, and now if each of these is zero, then what happens to the Taylor series? The Taylor series just zero. Zero, right? It's a zero series. Okay, good. And. Uh, so what does it converge to? What function does the zero series converge to? The zero function everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Good. Now let's look at the original function and compare it with the zero function. Where does this function agree with the zero function? At zero. At zero. Does it agree anywhere else? No, because exponential of any real number is, is always positive, right? Mm -hmm. So it's for x not equal to zero, the answer is non-zero. Okay, good. So we have we have our example, which should uh, show what we want, that you have a function whose Taylor series converges to a completely different function, which agrees with it only at the point, right? So so that's, that's sort of the best we can hope for, because the Taylor series will agree with the function at the center of, by, relative to which you're taking the Taylor series, just by definition of Taylor series. What's the constant term? What's the Taylor series uh, evaluated at zero? Well, it will just be f0, right, in general. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is the Taylor series has to agree with the original function at the point x0, which in our case is 0. And what we are showing here is that we could have a situation where it doesn't agree anywhere else. So let's now try to explain why we have this nice behavior. Or rather, this uh, horrible behavior, whichever you want to think of it. Okay, so first of all, why is f continuous at 0? The piecewise definition, it's not, you have to actually think about why it's continuous. Well, what is limit x approaches 0 exponential of minus 1 over x squared? Well, x is approaching 0. So what's x squared approaching? 0. 0 from what side? Well, whether x is approaching 0 from the left or the right, x squared will approach 0 from the right. Right. It's positive. Minus, so 1 over that will therefore approach negative infinity. Well, 1 over that will approach infinity and negative 1 over that will approach negative infinity. Yes, so this whole thing approaches negative infinity. And what's the exponential of something approaching negative infinity? Here's a graph of the exponential function. What's the exponential of something approaching negative infinity? Zero. Yes, so it approaches zero. And so this limit is zero. Okay, so good, so it's continuous. That's a start. We are in fact claiming it's infinitely differentiable at zero and all the derivative values at zero are zero. So let's check f prime zero. What's f prime zero? Well, you cannot just differentiate this and, and take the value of that at zero because it's a piecewise definition. When you have a piecewise definition, you have to take the derivative as a limit of a difference quotient. So it's limit h approaches zero. What? 
Mm-hmm. Where it's a limit of the difference quotient. Yeah. So what's this difference quotient going to be? Uh, exponential of minus one over <coughs> x plus h squared. X is zero, right? You're doing f prime oh, same. h squared. Minus the function value at zero is just zero. Mm-hmm. Over h. Okay. So it's the limit as h approaches zero. 1 over h, x of minus 1 over h squared. Um, now, if you put u as 1 over h, what do we get? Well, it's the limit as u approaches. It could be plus or minus infinity, depending on whether you're taking the left or right uh, approach to 0. u times the exponential of what? Into u squared. Uh, negative u square. Okay, good. Now, uh, this is polynomial growth, right? Mm-hmm. This, on the other hand, is exponential decay because you have a minus here. Another way of thinking of it is it's u, I mean, this you could write as u divided by e to the u square. Okay, this is polynomial growth and this is exponential decay. So what happens when you multiply them? What does it go to as u approaches plus minus infinity? Zero. Zero. And so f prime zero is zero. Okay. Now, one could of course similarly try to calculate f double prime, f triple prime. In all cases, what will happen is you'll get something uh, of this type. Well, you'll get some thing in one over h times e to the minus one over h square. When you put u as one over h, you'll have like a polynomial or rational function type of thing times this exponential. Well, actually it's super exponential in the in our strict sense where we define exponential as just something that's exponential in u and super exponential, exponential in higher power of u. But whichever way you want to label it, it's polynomial times something which is much faster than polynomial decaying. And therefore uh, the overall, it will go to zero and the same idea will be true for all the higher derivatives. So that's why all the higher derivatives at zero are zero. Well, you, it's of course a little harder to actually uh, write down the formal proof. For uh, those of you who sort of maybe are familiar with some other something about e to the minus x square rather than e to the minus one over x square, what we've done is we are basically using the fact that e to the minus x square sort of decays so fast that any polynomial times that also goes to zero. Uh, that sometimes there, there's a term for that called Schwartz functions, which are rapidly decaying functions at infinity. And this is basically you're just taking the uh, recipe, sort of doing a Schwartz function. Composed with a reciprocal. And the reason you're putting the square is just to kind of make sure that the behavior is the same at plus mi- and minus infinity. Okay. So this is sort of the rough idea. Okay. Uh, and and so we have this. So what intuitively what is happening? What kind of function does this look like? This e to the minus one over x squared function. Well, what do you expect it to look like? So at zero, it's zero, just that's how we defined it. It must be a very, very sharp jump at zero, or near zero. Well, all the derivatives are zero. So maybe you mean the opposite of what you said, right? Are the... uh, well, it kind of, it's kind of something that actually, if you, if you take any of, what are the Taylor polynomials of f at zero? They're all zero, right? With the Taylor series is zero. So if you are trying to approximate f by any polynomial function, the best approximation near zero would be the flat thing, the constant function zero, right? So it actually sort of looks almost like a constant function. However, uh, however large the degree uh, approximation you want to do, if you want to approximate f by a polynomial of degree at most 5,000, 
even among all those polynomials, the best approximation is still the flat zero function. However, the function is not actually zero. It's actually sort of growing a bit. But the growth is so, so small near zero that, that, that the Taylor series is zero. All the Taylor polynomials are zero. Okay. So it sort of looks almost like uh, zero, but it's still actually uh, not zero. Okay. And what happens far away from zero as x approaches uh, infinity? What happens? Let's see. So, so e to the is one. Oh, approaches. Yeah, approaches one. Uh, let's see. So e to the minus one over uh, approaching infinity or minus infinity. Either way, you'll get that it approaches uh, uh, one. Yes. Uh, yes, slow. No, wait. <laughs> yeah, approaches one. Yeah. So. And it's symmetric, so it shows up the picture. But the point is near zero, it, it sort of looks very flat. Okay, and so uh, that that's what happens. Now, what's the significance of this? Well, we could actually do other variations of this now that we have this. We could do, if you want, you could do this function. This would also And I'll call this g because I don't want to. There's a new function g. What is this? Well, to the right of zero, it's growing like e to the minus one over x squared. What happens on the left of zero? It's, it's zero, zero, right? So it's it's flat. So here you have this interesting situation. You have a function. This function is infinitely differentiable everywhere. Oh, by the way, I didn't say this, but f is infinitely differentiable everywhere, not just at zero, but at other points. And at points other than zero, it's nice in the sense that uh, it is locally analytic. The power series does converge to the function. Okay. But at zero, even though it's infinitely differentiable, the power series doesn't converge to the function. The same is true for g. Well, g is infinitely differentiable everywhere. At any point other than zero, it's in one of these pieces. And within each piece, the power series converges to the function. Mm -hmm. However, at zero, uh, the power series is just a zero series and it converges to the function on the left side, but not on the right side. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, the other interesting thing about this function is it's sort of, it's an example of a function that uh, sort of very smoothly leaves zero in the following sense. So, you have seen that, you know, uh, how can, how can a function change? Well, one way you can think is if it's, if it's a, uh, you, so a function can sort of change its direction or change its nature. One way is, is a, is a sort of sudden jump, right? You can have, uh, this type of jump. Okay. There it's not even continuous. Okay. The other type of the next, the somewhat nicer situation is where it kind of, changes direction, but it doesn't jump. Okay. So here it's continuous, but it's not differentiable at the point. Mm -hmm. Right. What's another type of situation? Well, you can have a situation where it's, uh, where it's differentiable, but it's not twice differentiable. So sort of, if you're thinking of physically, then sort of the, the speed is speed remains well-defined throughout, but the acceleration sort of is discontinuous. Okay. So you could have a situation maybe I mean, it's harder to see this uh, pictorially, but maybe it's a straight line and then suddenly it starts sort of moving and, and it, the, it remains differentiable everywhere, but it does start turning suddenly. The second derivative, uh, changes suddenly. Okay. And then you can keep making, uh, having more and more smooth notions of sudden change, right? You can have a situation where the fun, where the place where the function changes definition, it's, uh, 20 times differentiable, but not 21 times differentiable, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what this is giving is it's an example where the function is changing definition, right? It's changing definition from a flat zero thing to an e to the minus one over x square and changing definition in a manner that is not captured by the derivative. So as far as all the derivatives are concerned, it's changing. It's, it's sort of smooth, right? Mm -hmm. 
So all the derivatives appear to be smooth. So the derivatives, the derivatives will not detect any change of direction, but it's still changing definition. If you look at the local analytic behavior, you do see that at the point zero, it's jumping in definition. Now, wh wh why would this be important? That you can have a function that actually changes definition so smoothly that all the derivatives are continuous through the change of definition. Why would that be important? Hmm? I don't know. Well, it's actually quite important. And uh, the reason is that you can now do funny things. The, this, this type of idea is, there's an idea called a bump function. The idea is bump, bump function. Oh, bump. Oh, bump. I saw this bump. So the idea is uh, you have one function here. You have, you have like, uh, well, let's say the simple case. You have a function that's zero here and that's one here. Constant zero here, constant one here. Now you can use this type of construction to get to fill this in in between in such a way that it's infinitely differentiable throughout. Okay, so you can use this type of idea. This type of idea was just zero to e to the minus one of x, but you can come, you can sort of do this type of construction twice, or you can vary this construction and actually get a function that changes definition smoothly from a constant zero to a constant one. Mm -hmm. So it's a very smooth shift from one definition to another. Okay, all the derivatives seem to think it's closest, which means that if I have a function somewhere and I have another function anywhere else, I can sort of smoothly transition from one function to another to the other by using this bump function type construction. And, and it's not just for the zero and one. If I have any function, any a C infinity function here and a C infinity function here, I can sort of, even if they're seem totally unrelated, I can sort of fill it, fill in the remaining stuff so that it goes smoothly from this to that. Okay, so that's the importance. It's also something very unique to real numbers. The similar thing for complex numbers is far from true. Okay, that's sort of, in that way real numbers are nicer or less nice, whichever you want to think of it. Okay, great.